think about whether or not you want to implement it. Like I said, this is a pretty well written document as far as, as amount of details that they're giving you. As a matter of fact here, they have this trip light LC2400. Line conditioner provides EMI filtration as well as voltage regulation. Other types of surge protectors are also available with EMI filtration. Now, again, this unit right here goes for about 300 bucks. I always recommend, just as they did, stay with the cheapest um, resolutions rather than immediately dropping thousands of dollars because it's very easy to do. When you're fighting something, you don't even really know what you're fighting or uh, the level at which you're fighting it. So if you still continue to have issues, I would have your line uh, actually checked to make sure that the conditioning is correct before investing in something like this. Now, again, it's totally up to you, the end user, but it's something to think about. And then, of course, they tell you a voltage regulator placed between your power outlet and your electronics can filter EMI. Okay. Um, but of course, they never always leave out the price of what these units cost. They should let everybody know just to give you guys a heads up. But I already know this is about 300 bucks. Um, frequency EMI problems increase when the frequency of the signals increase because high frequency radiators uh, produce EMI more effectively. Reducing operating frequencies, if possible, while maintaining economical performance may reduce EMI. Now, you guys don't really have a lot of control over the frequencies. Okay, we focus once again shielding proper connections, and of course, filtering where applicable. Again, placement of everything, that's mandatory, and grounding, we're gonna get to there. Equipment selection, when you select different equipment from your shop, you may wanna consider the kinds which produce less EMI. As it gets older, some equipment will generate increased EMI. Other performance characteristics of older equipment may also decrease, but when replacing, keep the reduction of EMI in mind. Now, this is extremely important as you guys are, are dealing with cheaper systems as they're coming to market. I get questioned all the time, you know, what's the difference between this cutter and this one? What do you recommend? Um, if you're getting involved with plasma cutting, guys, do not cut corners on your cutter. That is your premier operating instrument for the machine, other than the machine just moving by itself. I mean, without the cutter and its performance, you're going to have issues. The higher end manufactured ones always are going to be built better okay there is no way to cut corners on on the actual quality of components being used with this type of equipment okay uh, hypotherm a miller um, as you guys become more familiar with these units you're going to see the price points they're up there compared to a harbor freight or you know some off brand from eastwood or you know whoever i would be very cautious about investing in a unit that again you're you're really taking a gamble you know i mean if you're especially if you're doing this as a startup or you're, you're really looking at you know i always hear the hobby term used but once again it's hobby today and tomorrow it's a business i would look at putting my money aside if i can't afford it this is my own personal opinion i've said this many times put the money aside and within a short amount of time the investment will pay for itself and it'll be well worth the wait you guys will have peace of mind Okay, as we go through here, let's go down. Okay. Equipment placement. EMI generated by welding and plasma cutting power supplies is generally more powerful when the sources are close to affected equipment. Locate the sources as far away from practical from the computer, CNC control, and other electronics in your system. They go over field strength. Distance is important. We've already covered that. Um, orientation, sometimes EMI radiation will reflect it uh, away rather than being absorbed. The angles or elevations of equipment are changed. Turn the electronics, computer, and welding plasma equipment to varying angles or raise and lower their locations to reorient the source to destination of, of EMI. It's interesting how placement, just something as simple as placement, really does all that. But that shows you how weird this is that we're working with. And that's like I said to you before, trying to be the CNC whisperer and trying to you know, help as many people as possible with machines I don't even see. That's in itself, it's amazing I can, I can help anybody just because of the fact I'm not there with you. But I've done this so much and gone over so many variables, we usually figure it out together. And again, it's not that we actually correct placement like this orientation. That's never something I usually cover. It's just going over the filtering devices and, of course, what we have optional available to us as tools to reduce it. Keep going. Cable routing. A cable that acts as either a transmitter antenna or receiving antenna for high frequency EMI signals will be less effective as an antenna when the distance separating it and other cables are increased. And it will sim similarly be less effective when the length of the cable is decreased. Cable separation. 
in the same way, adding distance, separating equipment reduces EMI, adding distance between cables does too. EMI radiates as fields, which are weaker the further from the source. We just covered that. Shorter cables, common sense. Use cables only long enough to get the job done. And when I say that, a foot or two longer, you're not going to have a problem, but you don't want to have a ridiculous amount of cable. What you see here, and I hate to say this, this is the majority of what most shops look like with plasma cutters, guys. The ones that I see, this is what I see. And it could be a pro-grade $50,000 table they didn't actually build themselves. This is what they typically are supplied with. And if these wires are set like this, you, number one, it's dangerous. I mean, without a doubt, it's dangerous. And that should be making everybody nod their head. And then on top of that, you know, you're trying to have precision machining done with equipment like this. It just doesn't make sense. You would never see a Haas with, with this kind of wiring done. Don't do it with a router or a mill or any other type of automated robot that you're expecting to be precise. This is not proper best practice, guys. Okay, keep cable routes tidy and well thought out to reduce EMI. Okay. Okay, cable crossing in almost every situation, some data or power cables or both must cross paths. EMI is worse when cables are parallel across at a shallow angle. The best method is to cross the cables perpendicular to each other. When they cross at 90 degrees, the level of crosstalk between the cables is reduced to its minimum. I mean, again, we're getting technical here. If we're using the proper cable, we don't have to go that route, but this is something you guys can implement. If you're building your own system, I've seen many guys do that. They'll actually give me feedback. Oh, you know, I did a uh, braiding of my cables and uh, I think I'm gonna be okay. Okay, if that's what you feel, I still prefer a shielded cable over that any day of the week. I mean, that's just a properly shielded cable along with proper grounding. When you combine those two, it's usually a bulletproof design. Uh, things with actual braiding done, I've seen systems with issues with that in the past. And again, it can be a hit and miss issue. You may have a reduced amount of EMI on one component and therefore a higher amount of EMI on another. Even though they're both braided, as far as the leads going to them, you may have penetration on one end. So just think about that, okay? Think about what I'm saying. Um, eliminate the problem from the beginning wholeheartedly. Don't leave a doubt, because if you leave a doubt, if you have a problem, you're always coming back to troubleshoot and trying to do a process of elimination. Cable coiling. Coil of wire forms a kind of filter that can reduce signal strength and lower the signal to noise ratio. Because it creates magnetic field instead of electric field, it may be more difficult to control by shielding. Cable should be made no longer than the correct practical length. Slack lengths of cable can be a safety hazard and untidy and can also help propagate EMI. Avoid Avoid coiling any excess lengths of plasma torch cables, arc welding cables, plasma or welder work cables, or power cables. Coils are more effective at radiating MI due to the magnetic fields formed through the coils. Shielded cables such as USB data cables carry current in both directions with low voltages. This tends to cancel EMI signals. Coiling them produces less EMI than, than coiling unshielded cables. Again, any of the cables I sell, especially with USB involved, um, where we're dealing with data communication, you're always going to want a ferret installed. You're always going to want double shielded. It's mandatory. Okay. And again, if you practice that same theory, we're doing the same thing because there's very few cables actually on a plasma other than general power that are not doing something with signals. Think about it. So again, implement the logical and you'll be fine. Over and under coiling. If cables must be coiled, coil them over and under to cancel the EMI. Reverse the twist on successive coils, laying them on the same side, one coil twists over, the next twists under. Instructions for over under coiling are available on the internet. Now, guys, that's what we're talking about, braided wires uh, to reduce RFI. Um, again, you can definitely check that out. I'm not gonna cover that because, again, I'm just a real big believer in going with what we know works with utilizing a Faraday cage effect, which is shielded cable. Um, as we continue down, you'll see exactly what we're going over. Here we go. Shielding and grounding. Shielding is a way to reduce the amount of EMI a cable will transmit or receive when it acts as an antenna. Shielding also can prevent unwanted radiation from entering or escaping from a device containing electronic circuits. Either way, the shield requires a reference potential ground connection to dissipate the EMI. Um, I always tell you guys, I don't care what cable you're using that's shielded, it's only effective if it's properly grounded, okay? Ferrites are really cool because you don't have to worry about grounding things, so it does make things a lot faster. Another technique I love to use, and this is, um, again, this is really old school type technique, is using the Faraday cage effect. 
If you're using a metal enclosure and you're using tin braided copper, if that Faraday, to get the Faraday effect, all we have to do is put the tin braided copper naturally over our conductors. If that conductor set that's inside the tin braided copper, once that tin braided copper naturally touches the metal enclosure, it will diffuse and ground to the enclosure. Okay, that will also save you soldering an actual lead, especially once again, when the enclosure, the electronics enclosure is properly grounded. So again, if you didn't catch all that, replay what I just said, I'm telling you right now, save you a bunch of time in doing all your ground leads if you don't have to, especially when you're gonna ground the actual enclosure of the electronics when it's completed. Faraday cage concept. The Faraday cage is an enclosure made from conductive material to block electric fields. It shields the enclosed circuits from an external EMI and stops any circuit generated EMI from escaping. A fully surrounded grounded enclosure provides complete shielding while one with holes in it can allow some EMI to come through. Well, I'm not going to lie, guys. My G540 system, of course, has holes in it because we have to let the system breathe. That's just logical. So once again, there's a point of no return. You're always going to have that. All electronic enclosures at one point or another will have a hole in it, uh, especially for CNC systems because they're going to have to require cooling where they should mandatorily. Um, think about that. You know, Think about what you're trying to actually accomplish. The Faraday cage effect, I've discussed this many times. I've had many challenges on it. Oh, it's not like that. This is exactly what they're saying it is. Matter of fact, Faraday cage in the reverse of microwave ovens block the escape and block the escape, excuse me, of dangerous microwave radiation used in cooking. Note that the metal screen in the glass window also keeps radiation inside. That's a pretty cool little tidbit. Um, again, we never stop learning. Many of you may not know that, but that's exactly what we're dealing with. Um, I can't emphasize it enough. Shielded cable with CNC is a godsend. Cutting corners on it is just like shooting yourself in the foot. Shielded enclosures. Circuit boards generate EMI and are also affected by it. Products with circuit boards are often shielded within metal enclosures that function as Faraday cages. When the enclosure is made of metal sheet or mesh or painted with conductive paint and connected to the reference potential earth ground, it behaves as a Faraday cage. That's exactly what we just covered. Holes in the enclosure for cables, buttons, indicators, etc. allow EMI to leak out and should be kept to a minimum. Logical. Shielded cable. In order to reduce EMI, cables are often provided with a shielded conductor, which creates an effective Faraday cage around the length of the cable. The shield is a metallic braid or spiral winding of metal foil or conductive plastic that surrounds the insulated signal carrying conduction in the cable. A protective insulating jacket typically covers the shielded layer. So you've got different types of shielded cable. I sell double shielded, which typically comes with the tin braided copper braid. And then on top of that, it comes inside with the mylar foil. You got single shielded cable, which typically is utilizing a mylar foil. Okay, uh, manufacturing process to make tin braided copper double shielded cable is a hell of a lot harder than the standard shielded cable. Henceforth, the price goes up. Many of you guys have done price comparisons, and you'll find out really quick there is a huge difference. Your disparities when it comes to flexibility and continuity, as far as that, are also going to be a huge disparity. Keep that in mind when you're fabricating your system, because. As we all know, you got cable change, you're routing cables everywhere. You want to select the proper gauge wire for the right job. Okay, I get questions on that on spindle cables all the time. Well, you know, my spindle cable's over here and I have to run it there. And, you know, this spindle's pulling five, uh, you know, it's five kilowatt spindle, four kilowatt spindle. Can I use 16.4? The 16.4 that I use with the proper type uh, insulation as far as the rating, that is what's going to give you guys the maximum flexibility. Again, I do use on my double shielded cable the internal twine to separate the leads. That being said, that's used to reduce friction when that cable flexes. Most cable you find that's double shielded does not include that, okay? Not unless you go into higher end spec cable where we're dealing again with larger corporations. But why do we have to have a large corporation if it's the right thing to do? And that's why I offer it. So again, use common sense when it comes to selecting the right cable. Again, here, just for definition, which I love that they actually illustrated. This is a coax cable. Principle is the same. They just chose to use a coax cable to show you the tin braided copper. Here's standard. Motor cables are typically wrapped in a foil ground shield, which will typically be connected to the CNC controller's internal ground. Now, what's really interesting with this is that um, and I wanted to discuss this. A lot of guys that are using plasmas, and the one thing I don't like is that they should have used a double shielded cable here to illustrate. Uh, plasma system, guys, that's why I went with signal cable with the G540 system that I, that I actually came up with for the motor cables. I did that because signal cable is a fancy term for saying double shielded. 
Okay, my motor cables are double shielded. I don't care if you're using a mill. I don't care if you're using a router. They're the only double shielded cables available for that actual system in a plug and play format for that reason. Keep it simple and make give you guys